Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world. You're welcome to yet another event in the African Literature Sessions Lecture Series for the 2021-2022 academic year. My name is Akin Adeshoko. I teach comparative literature and African cinema and media studies at Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana. It's been my pleasure and privilege to moderate this series over the past year and a half in collaboration with my colleagues in the Executive Council of the Association, including Matt Brown of the University of Wisconsin at Madison and Jess McCorkle of William and Hubbard College in Geneva, New York. The series began in September 2020 and has continued to receive the support of the current Executive uh, Council of the Association, particularly of the current president, Mohamed Kamara of Washington and Lee University, who is a co-organizer of the series. As always, would like to acknowledge the continuing support of the other members of the council, as well as the larger membership of the association. Due to your continuing attention and attendance at this series, it has come to be regarded as in the past year as a publicly engaged feature of the association's presence in this age when public engagement is roughly equivalent to being socially or civically responsive and digitally audible and visible when our, where our connections are, are stable. Uh, thank you, everyone. Today's lecture re returns us to the format of two authors with new books discussing their work separately, but with a strong possibility of compatible perspectives. Lindsay Green Sims, author of Queer African Cinemas, freshly out of Duke University Press, and Noah Seeker, whose new newest book, Cinematic Independence, Constructing the Big Screen in Nigeria, came out of the University of California Press this February. Both of them are, are two scholars of African cinemas with a shared intellectual outlook. And it is a welcoming opportunity to be able to listen to both of them today. I expect the same is true for the audience as well. The two books are different in thematic terms on the surface, but as far as I can tell, they hold three or four things in common. First, they are about topics that are liable to be overlooked in the constantly shifting priorities of scholars yielding to institutional pressures. Second, and paradoxically, these topics also indicate the move in African cinema scholarships into sub-themes and sub-fields, as the logic of writing about this cinematic tradition as an unmoving sphinx breaks down. Thirdly, they also show the earlier tendency among scholars to treat Nollywood and African cinema as separate spheres of artistic productions as contrived, occasional, and limited. Fourth, and as an elaboration of the last two points, they contribute to generating what I suspect are new theoretical possibilities for the dimensions of African discourse, to borrow the elegant phrase of Abiola Erili. All of this is to say that you, our audience, should expect a lively, perhaps transgressive opinionating during today's event. We'll start with Lindsay. We'll start with Professor Greensims, excuse me. Lindsay Greensims is Associate Professor of Literature at American University in Washington, DC. She is the author of Postcolonial Automobility, Car Culture in West Africa, which came out of the University of Minnesota Press in 2017, and Queer African Cinema, Duke University Press 2022, which is the focus of our contribution to today's lecture. Please unmute yourself and show your face, uh, Lindsay. Hello. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I've got a PowerPoint um, that will help to um, just keep me on track. So let me pull that up. Um, so first of all, thank you very much um, to, uh, to Akeen, uh, to the ALA for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to be in conversation um, with Noah, who's a scholar um, who I've been in conversation with um, for, uh, for years. Um, I have to say when I was asked to, um, to do this talk and um, I think the, the pitch was, you know, talk for about 20 minutes about the, the genesis of the project. Um, I was like, great, I can do that. You know, I wrote this book. I can certainly talk about the genesis. And then I started to sit down and think about what I was gonna say. And I was 
I stumped myself. I was like, wait, where did, what was the genesis? Like, where, where did this project start? Um, you know, when you're, when you're writing the last, um, the last few years of writing, um, you're really, you're really in the weeds, you're revising, you're, you're, um, you know, fine tuning the thesis, the thesis and the close reading. Um, and it had been so long since I thought about where this project started that it actually took me, um, it took me a minute to, to, to reflect. Um, about how far I've come. And so this has actually been a really interesting project to think about, uh, or interesting talk to think about um, that what is, what has been the genesis of this um, and how have I, and um, again, I'm glad you, you mentioned about the last point about thinking about um, Nollywood studies and um, as, as part and parcel of queer African cinemas and not, I'm sorry, as African cinema more broadly and is not uh, its own sort of field of study, um, because that was certainly part of the, the genesis for me. So um, I'm going to talk about the, the the way in which I think about the, the different film traditions. And that was, for me, actually part of figuring out what I was writing about. Um, and then um, and by talking about um, how the argument developed um, and, and thinking about some of the, the main people that I was in conversation with as I was writing. Um, so if I had to, to talk about the beginning of this, uh, of this book project, it would, it would actually start in, all the way back in 2007. And that's, that's why I was kind of stumped for, at the, the beginning. Um, I was in, in Ghana doing research for my first book project, um, uh, or for, it was a dissertation at that time. I, I hadn't even written the dissertation yet, um, which is on car culture in West Africa. Um, and I, I, I met the, the filmmaker, Socrates Safo, um, who I was uh, introduced to um, by Carmela Garitano, who is, you know, the person to read if you're interested in, in Ghanaian film. Um, and I was really just in, in sort of learning mode. I wasn't even in, in research mode. Um, and so um, Safo was taking me around Accra um, to some of his uh, sites where he was filming, to his studio. Um, he's... Um, He's very prolific and also very, um, very efficient. So in his in his van, um, in the front seat of the car, this the image is still really clear to me. He has a a, a TV monitor and not at that point uh, a VCR player, and um, this is so that he can watch films and he can edit um, in Accra uh, traffic in the go slows. Um, so uh, so. Yeah, so I was um, I was in, in in his van, and he showed me this film um, called Women in Love. And the reason that he picked this to show me was because he said this was his most popular film. Um, he was in the middle of remaking it. Um, the remake was ha hadn't been finished yet, but it was was called Jezebel. Um, and he thought I'd also be interested in it because um, the anthropologist Brigitte Meyer had written about Women in Love, and so he shows me this film. And the film is about a young woman who wants to become wealthy, but um, doesn't quite know how to. And so she is introduced um, by a friend um, to, to become part of a, a cult, um, a mamiwata or um, water spirit, mermaid spirit cult. Um, and the, the gist is, is that if she joins the cult, um, she's never allowed to sleep with men again. They, uh, she will go mad if she does. And she's only allowed to sleep with women. But if she if she agrees to this, um, then she will have all the wealth that she wants. Um, and so she agrees, and you know, uh, many hours of plot ensues. But so I watched this film with um, with Sappho um, in his car as I'm also you know looking out the you know the window. And I think from a you know from my perspective, writing about cars, though this is really interesting to think about you know the confluence of film and cars. But in terms of the plot of the film. Um, I didn't really at this point have the critical tools to understand um, the, the occult aspect of it. I was I, just frankly very confused. Um, also on this trip, so I didn't really have a lot of like follow-up questions for him about the film in, in, you know, in particular. Um, I also met on this trip um, the anthropologist Serena Dankwa, um, who, um, whose book um, Knowing Women came out last year and is, I think, to, to me, the really the most important um, recent book in queer African studies, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, she was researching um, communities um, of, of women who sleep with women in smaller Ghanaian towns. Um, and she had also heard of this film and um, talked about it with some of the um, people, some of her subjects. And the, just the, the, basically what they, they said was that it was a film 
um, that they thought one was a cautionary tale that warned them against um, sleeping with older women. Um, and that also was really harmful um, in the way that it reproduced um, uh, some really negative stereotypes about them. Um, so I had this kind of tension. This was at the moment, you know, one of the only queer films circulating, certainly in West Africa. Um, it was, it kind of blew my mind that it even existed. It was, you know, Safa was telling me, oh, this is my most popular film. On the other hand, this was not what you think of as queer cinema. This wasn't, you know, this wasn't what people were, you know, watching to, you know, in terms of visibility, it was a film that they found to be really um, harmful and, and offensive. And so I just kind of filed all that away and went to work on the dissertation. Um, I came home from that trip with a ton of um, uh, Nollywood films to watch. And, um, uh, and as I was watching those films, interestingly, um, I wound up finding other films that had some of these themes. Um, so, and again, this wasn't, I wasn't at first um, looking for them. Um, I, I, I found them. Um, just because I was, you know, trying to trying to figure out what Nollywood, Nollywood was and watching a lot of them. Um, but I found a few more that were like Jezebel and Women in Love, in which um, they had um, plots in which lesbians and later gay men, but this wasn't until like 2010 that you saw this, um, were predatory. Um, they were kind of seen as a threat to morality and to social order. But at the same time, they, you know, I was kind of, my mind was kind of blown that these films um, existed um, and, um, and, and I was interested. And I wound up um, uh, in 2010 uh, writing a paper with Unoma Azul. We went to, to Nigeria together um, and interviewed, um, you know, audiences and uh, filmmakers and the censors board in Abuja, um, trying to make sense of this. And, um, so a paper came out of that and a paper also came out of um, my discussion of this film, Beautiful Faces, um, uh, thinking about the confluence of um, lesbianism and, and prostitutes and how in a lot of these films, they were kind of seen to be similar types of characters. Um, so I wrote those two papers. I was also starting to think about Jezebel. I had now had the critical tools to think about Jezebel. Um, but I certainly didn't think that I had a, a book project at this particular moment. Um, I'll say at the time, the other the other two films that I was um, that I had looked at and I was interested in um, were what you would consider, um, you know, the, the francophone art films. Um, and at the beginning of uh, the beginning, or not the beginning, but you know, we used to think about Dollywood as kind of separate from from the art films. Um, uh, I wasn't I wasn't thinking about Nollywood as uh, uh, a completely separate entity, but uh, these films were really different than the Nollywood films. Um, Dakan, um, although I would say that neither of these were made by queer filmmakers. Um, the Dakan, uh, which came out in 1997, um, is a film um, uh, from Guinea, which is about two teenage boys who fall in love and it actually eventually kind of set up to, sorry for the spoiler alert, um, make a life for themselves, Carmen Gay, um, is a Senegalese adaptation of the uh, Car Bizet's um, famous Carmen opera. And in this version, um, Carmen is bisexual, she suits with men and women. And I was thinking about Carmen in particular um, and the jazz score and the improvisational um, uh, um, aspects of the structure of the film and thinking about that in terms of queerness. Um, but I was really thinking of these as separate papers or perhaps a book project that had to do with, um, with outcast characters, with, with women who were um, out, outcast in some ways, but it wasn't necessarily a, a, a project on queer African cinema in part because I just didn't think that the, um, the archive was there. Um, I mean, in part, it just didn't, it didn't occur to me um, that I could write you know, a book with four chapters um, at that particular moment. Um, but what happened was around the time that I was finishing up my first book, the dissertation became the first book, um, there were um, a handful of other queer African films um, that came out and that were actually garnering a lot of international attention. Um, so in 2014, story, the Nest Collective, a, a, an artist collective from Kenya, um, released Stories of Our Lives, and I happened to be able to see it at a film festival in Washington, D.C. Um, in 2015. Um, in 2017, um, The Wound by a South African film by John Kenegrove came out, and that film um, actually ha had a lot of international publicity um, 
in part, yeah, in, there was the, the sort of censorship in Braulio, but also in part because it followed um, the film Moonlight, Barry Jenkins' Moonlight, which won an Oscar, um, which is um, a queer African American film. Um, but I remember seeing articles, um, you know, about you know South Africa's Moonlight, um, which the films are very different. But I think it, it kind of um, brought you know brought the, these films to to the attention of the international community. Um, and then I had read a uh, in a in a blog um, that uh, the Kenyan filmmaker Wanyari Kahu um, was making uh, a film version of uh, the short story Jambula Tree. It wasn't titled at the time, of course, now it's, it's Rafiki, um, but the Jambula Tree was a story I knew um, about two girls that actually takes place in Uganda who fall in love. Um, so all of these, this was a, kind of an interesting moment. I was finishing up the book, uh, I was finishing up the first book, um, and all of a sudden there just kind of seemed to be um, a, a chatter and, and, and a, a, I wouldn't say an explosion, but all of a sudden there seemed to be a lot more films um, that weren't uh, that weren't just the Nollywood films, which I, in some sense, felt like I had I had written about, um, even though there were a lot of them. Um, but I, I I felt kind of like okay, well I I said what I had to say about those films, um, until I started to realize that I had a project. <laughs> um, I had a book project, um, and I was really interested not just in the films, but in the ways that they were circulating, and so. I started to um, to find out about and to attend um, queer film festivals on the African continent. And the first one I was able to go to um, was the Queer Kampala International Film Festival in 2017. Um, I went also in 2018, the photo is actually taken from 2018. Unfortunately, this was the opening night and then the next day um, it got raided by the police. So it never, it never, um, uh, never completed the, the second year of it. But, um, I went to, yeah, I went to the Queer Kampala Film Festival, I went to a festival in Nairobi, the, um, the Out Film Festival in Nairobi, um, and the Bato Balorato Festival in, in Botswana to think about um, the ways that audiences were, inter were interacting with films. Um, and I would say too that interestingly, most of the films, many of the films that were played uh, at these film festivals were, were not African films, um, which was, uh, you know, another, another interesting question. Um, I also found at the uh, Queer Kampala International Film Festival, they showed um, the film Hell or High Water, which is a Nigerian film made by an organization, the Initiative for Equal Rights, that was starting to make Nollywood films that had more sympathetic um, uh, gay characters. And I will say that the audience just loved this film. Um, so it was a departure from the Nollywood films um, in some sense, but still utilizing Nollywood stars, Nollywood format. Um, and that was that was another thing that was really interesting to me. Um, so then I had to figure out um, what, how to talk about all these really different films and film reception. How to how to figure how to talk about this in in a book and how to put it together um, in a sense. How to have a thesis. I remember writing a grant proposal early on, and a colleague uh, looked at it and said, "Great topic, but what's your thesis?" Which is of course what we say to our students all the time. Um, and I was like, "Oh, right." Um, and as I, uh, this was kind of early on, and I, I started to think about how all of these films, um, all of these films uh, were in very different ways uh, about, about resistance and about different forms of resistance. Um, so I came up with this way of thinking about all these films together um, through what I call the registers of resistance. Um, and I, what I mean by registers of resistance are, are four things. Um, the very basic level, registering queer African existence at a moment when it's often denied. So even the Nollywood films that are more homophobic, um, uh, they're they're doing something I think that's really fascinating, right? They're um, and actually Noah Noah has written about this um, quite well. Um, so we might have a conversation about this later, but um, they were showing that queer Africans existed at a moment where everyone's like, no, it doesn't happen. It doesn't. That's not African. Uh, we don't do that here. Um, and so all of these films were, were, were reg registering um, the presence of queer African life. Um, I also started to think about how some of these films, um, resistance was not about organizing or you know, these overt political struggles, um, but resistance was found in these like kind of quieter and more intimate moments. And so I heard thinking about um, registers in terms of like the sonic frequency. So I was listening to you know, different registers of resistance that are quiet or subtle, 
um, and that are sometimes expressions of interiority or intimacy. Um, I was also thinking about resistance um, as something that can act in favor of power. Um, understanding resistance um, kind of in a little bit in the psychoanalytic way is something that uh, the unconscious refuses to allow, um, something that might disrupt the status quo, um, right? And so thinking about how um, films were both reject, you know, registering the existence of poor Africans and also, um, and I'm not only talking about the Hollywood films here too, but also um, kind of, you know, this, this refusal to allow for something that would um, that would really um, integrate um, queer people in, in society. Um, and that, that I think is the most, the most difficult one and um, might wind up talking about that in the discussion. Um, and, I, and then also just to understand the ways that films, um, the different ways that audience might register these films. In other words, um, one film might read as, as totally, you know, uh, progressive and life affirming, affirming to one audience member and the other audience member thinks, oh, well, you know, that queer person, did, it didn't turn out so well for, for that queer person. And so um, that, you know, that to me, you know, uh, depending on the person's take, but that to me, you know, just shows that queerness is, is, you know, is dangerous or, you know, not a good idea. And so, you know, the same film might register really different to different people. Um, and so I wanna read this quote here. I'm keeping an eye on my time here won't go over the 20 minutes. Um, so I write, it has indeed been a challenge to put the types of film that, that queer Africans have largely found to be homophobic, films that often resist projects that make queer, queer African lives habitable next to life affirming films. But it is precisely this juxtaposition that has helped me to understand how all queer African films, regardless of why they were made or who made them, invite an understanding of resistance as a messy process that entails both opposing and consenting to forms of power that involves fearing for the worst, but dreaming of the best, and that sometimes demands slow or imperfect forms of negotiation. Um, and I realized too, um, that I really needed to stretch my understanding of resistance. And these are two books that, that helped me do so. Um, and I needed to start thinking about what happens if you think about resistance as something more mundane or indeterminate and ongoing. Um, or is something that draws from rather than is opposed to vulnerability. Um, and I think to me, um, and this led me to, to these questions, um, what happens when intimacy, pleasure, small gestures of unruliness, practices of survival and fleeing, or even of negotiation are, are imagined as conditions or resources for resistance? What happens when we see resistance not as the opposite of subordination and complacency, but as something that is entangled with it? What happens when we take seriously the framing of resistance as something that might be routine or vague, as something that hovers in the space of the meanwhile? My position is that when we disengage resistance from its progressive teleology and its binary relations to subordination, to domination, to vulnerability, we can better attend to all of the imperfect forms of adaptation, life building, and belonging that more indeterminate forms of resistance make possible and that exist alongside the necessary work of overt and strategic political organizing. Um, and I wanna end with um, <clears throat> this last slide here um, to, to kind of just mark some of the, the people, uh, the feminists and queer black scholars um, from both sides of the Atlantic that I was thinking with and reading as I was um, coming up with ways to theorize these films and to think about resistance and queerness and vulnerability Intimacy, silence, survival, imagination, and life building. Um, I mentioned Uno Mazua at the beginning, um, who uh, was a co researcher for some of the stuff that I did on the early Nollywood. Um, and I should also mention too, Zaytwal Ima, um, who I co edited the uh, journal, a uh, special issue of the Journal of African Cultural Studies with. Um, and we also co wrote um, the introduction. And that um, I, I was kind of in the revision process of the book, but it, it helped me to really articulate and think about. Um, some of the things I was thinking about in terms of, of intimacy. Um, and the other names here too, um, I mentioned uh, Serena Dakwa um, in her book, Knowing Women, um, which I think is a, is a must read, but the other thinkers too, I mean, it, this is not, a, a, you know, this is not the full list, um, but these are people that I was um, really thinking with and thinking through as I was writing um, and thinking. So um, I'll stop there, but um, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's very engaging and very uh, 
uh, stimulating and uh, some questions that will come, especially from me about that. So thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to Noah uh, Sika. Our next speaker, Professor Noah Sika, is an associate professor of media studies at Queens College at CUNY, that is CUNY, New York. Uh, he's, the, he's the author of several books, such as Traumatic Imprints, Think 2.0, and Nollywood Stars, Cinematic, uh, and Nollywood Stars. Cinematic Independence, Constructing the Big Screen in Nigeria, coming out of University of California Press uh, in 2022, is his latest book and the basis of his presentation today. Your turn, Noah. Thank you so much. I want to begin by thanking the African Literature Association for this wonderful opportunity. I'm a big fan of the lecture series and it's such an honor to be a part of it. It's hard to get my home field, film and media studies to pay much attention to work on African cinema. So I'm especially grateful for this platform. Many thanks to Akina Deshokan for the initial invitation and to Mohamed Kamara and the other members of the ALA team. I also want to thank everyone at the University of California Press especially Raina Palivka. Academic books can be prohibitively expensive and the output of American university presses isn't always easily accessible on the African continent. So I really wanted my book to be available in a free open access edition and California made that possible with crucial support from the Robert and Merrill Selig Endowment Fund and Film Studies the Mellon Foundation, the Professional Staff Congress, and Queens College. So my book is available in a paperback edition, but also as a free download. While I've also worked on, Afri on queer African cinema, my latest book is essentially a history of theatrical film or large screen cinema in Southern Nigeria. I place Hollywood imperialism in the context of broader developments in the Nigerian economy in the 20th century and beyond. I argue that Nigeria has constituted an object of interest, source of inspiration, and site of market development for a wide range of Hollywood companies, from the major studios to a series of much smaller firms since as early as the 1920s. As in other parts of the world, Hollywood has imposed its will on Nigeria in ways that have dramatically reduced opportunities for local filmmakers. And yet the Nigerian state has not always been a powerless onlooker in this process. It has, in a variety of iterations, both facilitated and resisted Hollywood hegemony. As Akina Deshokan noted in 2004, most scholars of African cinema now look to the development of Nollywood in Nigeria as the solution to the chronic dependency of African filmmaking on French money and North American slash Western European art houses and academic curricula. Yet as Ed Shokan has also made clear, the situation has always been a lot more complicated than that. In Nigeria's tangled political history, seizing state power has sometimes involved working with and on rarer occasions working against Hollywood capital. My book considers the price of both complying with and combating Hollywood internationalism for producers, distributors, and exhibitors in Nigeria. My approach and many of my conclusions actually overlap with Lindsay's. I'm especially interested in highlighting the way we seek to offer nuanced accounts of independence and resistance, respectively. Lindsay asks, quote, what happens when we see resistance not as the opposite of subordination and complacency, but as something that is entangled with it? While resistance is often assumed to be transgressive or in opposition to power, it can often mean the exact opposite. I take a similar approach to the concept of independence, political, economic, and artistic. 
The deeply exploitative and sometimes punitive actions of the Hollywood majors do not tell the whole story. Nigeria was never a blank slate on which Hollywood could easily inscribe its aspirations. It was, as it remains, a source of specific obstacles and anxieties as much as of particular inspirations and profits. Other points of intersection between queer African cinemas and cinematic independence are worth noting. For instance, both books consider some of the legacies of European colonialism. In Lindsay's case, that means looking at how British penal codes written around the turn of the 20th century continue to structure the, criminaliz the criminalization of homosexuality and same-sex marriage in Nigeria, Uganda, and Kenya, even in the 21st century. Indeed, anti-sodomy laws drafted in 1897 have not only remained on the books in Nigeria, but have expanded and intensified, at least on paper, in recent years. In my case, this post-colonialist approach means understanding theatrical exhibition in relation to a system of urban management inherited from colonialism and designed for the protection of narrow elite interests, both foreign and domestic. Colonial planning laws remain entrenched in Nigeria and the long history of using these laws and their post-independence descendants to justify gentrification has culminated in land development plans that are decidedly not in the public interest but that are pursued by firms eager to acquire new and ever fancier real estate. Stephen Beresford has shown that planning legislation in Nigeria has been unable to check excessive developments driven by the private sector. Planning law and other mechanisms that have effectively excluded the citizenry from participating in the benefits of urban planning have also functioned to make multinational film companies key stakeholders thereby consolidating and expanding existing privileges. Regulatory hurdles are either non-existent or easily cleared by the likes of IMAX, Disney, and Coca-Cola. Nigeria now boasts the largest cinema chain in West Africa. The name of that chain is Film House. It's headquartered in Lagos. It has 14 multiplexes in seven Nigerian states, and it partners with major cinema technologies like IMAX and MX4D, which is a film presentation system developed by the American company Media Mation. Filmhouse is currently the exclusive West African licensee of Disney and Warner Brothers properties, and it has distribution arrangements with South Africa's Empire Entertainment and China's Huahua Media. Filmhouse also supplies streaming content to Netflix, among other companies. It's currently the largest supplier of Nollywood content to streamers all around the world. So how did Nigeria get here? What made Filmhouse possible? It's important to emphasize that Filmhouse is a vertically integrated company with a production and distribution branch called Film One and that it functions not only in collaboration with, but very much in the tradition of vertically integrated Hollywood firms. Lindsay's work demonstrates what's dangerous about a film like, about a firm like Film House having such disproportionate power in West Africa. She writes about how Film One agreed to stream the queer friendly 2018 Hollywood film, We Don't Live Here Anymore, but then got cold feet and pulled the film from its Nigerian site, allegedly in response to subscriber complaints, but probably also out of fear of government repri reprisals. In Nigeria's current first run theatrical marketplace, there are precious few alternatives to Film House, as Genevieve Naji recently complained when her directorial debut, Lionheart, was denied a significant theatrical release despite the superstar's best efforts. The temporal unit under analysis in cinematic independence is admittedly expansive, beginning with the global transition to sound cinema and what Marxist economists have identified as the P 
period during which the United States moved from classical imperialism to a new category of international exploitation founded on the products of the second industrial revolution, including motion pictures, and extending into the present, which I treat as history. In my telling, the 21st century emergence of multiplexes in Nigeria, rather than a historical rupture, represents merely the realization of certain long cherished ambitions and the reconfiguration of others with dedicated IMAX theaters replacing Cinerama facilities, digital delivery and projection replacing more labor intensive forms of celluloid based playback and so on. My book explores the connective potential of the big screen as both built space and aspirational idea. Theatrical film not only links Nigeria's past and present, as today's successes are built upon the failures and false starts of the independence decade in particular, it also serves as a means of examining Nigeria's broader implication in American capital. Certain parallel trajectories are discernible in the two countries' experiences of large screen cinema. Indeed, volatility has hardly been unique to Nigeria. Hollywood underwent its own upheavals during the second half of the 20th century, finding itself caught up in various forms of state and private corruption and subject to periodic financial emergencies. <clears throat> Many of the multi-service corporations that suddenly owned American movie studios in the 1960s had interests that were already being met in Nigeria, particularly by the oil sector. Their diversified holdings were in many cases functions of African natural resources, including the zinc and silver so central to Gulf and Western, which owned Paramount and which had been turning to Nigeria since the company's founding in 1958. Despite these overlapping histories of extractive capitalism, even the most critical accounts of global Hollywood make no mention of Nigeria, or for that matter, of the African continent. All too often, writes Laura Fair, Africa is ignored or marginalized in studies of worldwide developments. The continent is consigned to the global shadows, as if Africa were tangential rather than central to the unfolding of truly global experiences. Calling for scholarship that destabilizes historiographies of underdevelopment and depictions of Africa and Africans as always scrambling to catch up to the rest of the world. Fair provides her own groundbreaking study of the business of film exhibition in urban Tanzania in the 20th century, tracing a long durée history of cinematic modernity in East Africa and thereby contesting familiar justifications for the continent's historiographic exclusion. What would a history of Hollywood look like if it acknowledged the persistent significance of Nigeria to the development and dissemination of American media? And what would a history of Nigerian media look like if it accounted for Hollywood's many incursions into the country? My book challenges the sort of historiographical orthodoxy that would leave Nigeria and Africa in general out of discussions of economic globalization, owing either to ignorance or to a determined ethnocentrism. This project originated in a series of conversations with some of the members of Nollywood's youngest generation of filmmakers with whom I initially met in order to better understand the emergent industrial formation known as New Nollywood. I noticed that rather than focusing on narrative and stylistic elements, which are so often centralized in elitist coverage of New Nollywood as a source of allegedly superior films, most of my interlocutors were emphasizing instead the political economy of Nigerian media calling attention to exhibition strategies that build as reflections of a free media system marked by healthy capitalist competition were in fact anything but. Many like Mildred Okwo, whose award-winning films include 2012's The Meeting, brought up the matter of vertical integration, tying current oligopoly conditions in Nigeria 
to the characteristic business practices of studio era Hollywood with its vertically integrated major companies. By 1962, all of the Hollywood majors had permanent distribution offices in Lagos. In addition, the Motion Picture Export Association of America, which is sometimes dubbed the Little State Department due to its close ties, not just to that department, but also to the US Department of Commerce, had a permanent office in Lagos, one of only a handful of such offices around the world. My methodology blends archival research on the late colonial and early independence period periods with interviews, participant observation, and close textual analysis. The point being to excavate the past and the present and suggest how the seeds of recent developments were planted and predicted by the political and economic strategies of earlier iterations of what has been called electronic colonialism, the colonization of communications space, and capitalist imperialism. Hope has long characterized Hollywood's approach to the African continent, and it continues to prompt press releases that tout Nigeria as a new, much needed outlet for American capital. In 2016, the Motion Picture Association of America announced that the North American market had plateaued at approximately $11 billion while African theatrical markets, particularly in Nigeria, were sources of steady growth and objects of heightened attention. Such plateauing is at least partly attributable to con contradictions within the capitalist system of which Hollywood is so openly enamored while simultaneously receiving all manner of state subsidies, of course. Suffering at home despite being publicly funded, Hollywood turns to Nigeria for much needed revenue. If the industry's domestic hardship is nothing new, as the continuous post-1946 crisis of theater attendance attests, then neither is its attention to Nigeria, a veritable obsession that is both symptom and cause of Hollywood's home front troubles. The degree of the industry's attention to Nigeria, the level of desperation underwriting it, is what has fluctuated for close to a century, but the attention itself has been ongoing. Among my sources are the writings of nationalist leaders, scholarly and popular publications on Nigeria's economic promise, the papers of American and Nigerian diplomats, consular reports, excuse me, and the reports of American economic intelligence. Among the archival collections that I tapped were in Nigeria's Center for Black and African Arts and Civilization, the University of Lagos, the University of Ibadan, and in the United States, the Rockefeller Archives Center, the Library of Congress, and the National Archives and Records Administration with its central foreign policy files, central intelligence agency records, and general records of the Department of State. My goal in this book was to keep the current multiplex era in dynamic alignment with the developments of Nigeria's independence decade, to read two distinct post-colonial moments equally marked by cinematic ambition and the construction of the big screen in relation to one another. In plain English, to say something is constructed means that it's not a mystery that has popped out of nowhere, writes Bruno Latour. My book attends as much to the movie theater's many origins, whether humble, visible, or interesting in Latour's terms, as to its final forms, which include air-conditioned exhibition halls, single-screen art cinemas, IMAX-equipped multiplexes, socially distanced spaces where patrons' temperatures are checked, and so on. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic represents another shared crisis of Hollywood and Nollywood capital. From March until October 2020, all of Nigeria's movie theaters were shut down. When they reopened in the fall of 2020, COVID-19 experienced a resurgence in Nigeria. But thanks to the lobbying efforts of the Cinema Exhibitors Association of Nigeria, the multiplexes eventually received robust government support 
in the form of tax breaks and other subsidies. And so they've managed to stay open ever since. Today, neatly separating Hollywood and Nollywood is occasionally challenging, particularly given increasingly common factors like Netflix and Amazon. Such a relationship troubles the simplistic dichotomy of center and periphery. At present, Nollywood is very much a participant, however partial or undercompensated, in the formal world economy. In this book, I heed what Catherine Hall calls the imperative of placing colony and metropole in one analytic frame. Inserting Nigeria into film and media history means recovering the practical as well as discursive contributions of an array of individuals and organizations from both sides of the Atlantic. Placing Nigeria in film and media history is not only fills gaps in the literature on Hollywood imperialism, but also sheds light on some of the overlooked itineraries of independent, non-commercial, and non-theatrical works. It clarifies Nigeria's role as a magnet for American capital, a role that the country has played across ever-shifting political configurations, and that far from being constrained by government corruption, has often been facilitated by such malfeasance. Cinematic independence delineates this complex history and its many implications for the field of film and media studies. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you again. And I look forward to uh, discussion. Okay, well, thank you. Um... That's quite a lot to uh, to ponder over. Thank you, Noah. Uh, you can both turn on your video and uh, and unmute yourself so that our audience members can see you. Um, thank you. Uh, usually, we start by taking questions from the uh, from the audience, and uh, as soon as they come, you will know uh, you have those. Uh, from what I can see, there's nothing yet or has not been posted to us. So in order to keep things going, I'll just thank both of you, uh, start by thanking you for your contributions. These are actually very interesting. Uh, these are books that are very new. Uh, most people aren't, I can imagine, especially because, you know, uh, I, mean, I think your book came out in March, uh, Lindsay and uh, Noah in February. And so uh, most people wouldn't have read them. And, and I, we thank you for sort of talking about them in this very uh, summary, ways and really giving people an idea of how the books are generated and what you try to do. So that gives people a fair idea of what to, to look forward to as they read your book. And as, as the moderator, I happen to have read them, uh, both because they're in my area and also because uh, I do have to, in order to be able to actually uh, do the work of moderation. And sort of the ad additional task is for me to be able to then mediate between you and the audience, uh, which is to say that I'll be asking questions to start off, questions that may be very clear to you <laughs> because of what you said in the book, but because I'm assuming correctly that most people have not, and even if they haven't, uh, this is uh, a discussion that's really in intended to generate uh, insight and uh, generate discussion. So I'll be asking questions that may be clear to both of us about issues that may be clear to both of us, but that may not be clear to everyone. So if it seems as if I'm asking you obvious questions, questions are obvious because I've read the book, <laughs> it's deliberate because I'm not assuming that everybody has. And the way I would then like to start is ask both of you a fairly, I would say, uh, may, may come across as complicated uh, or complex, but to me actually makes a lot of sense, both in terms of really what, how your books are positioned and the arguments that you've made in the books and that you've also sort of uh, elaborated in your presentations today. So um, in your trying to sort of put a theoretical spin on your argument, uh, Lindsay, you talked about the idea of registers of resistance in a very interesting way. It's uh, difficult to resolve, and uh, it's actually good that you didn't try to resolve it. Of course, you sort of telescope how it might be understood. And the way you talked about it, you use a word in the, in the introduction, uh, it's murkiness. 
murkiness uh, or contradiction, you know, which according to uh, a philosopher is our only hope <laughs> of that contradictions, we, we don't exist. So, um, so that's one thing. And so that's actually very generative because it actually says it doesn't tend to think in binary terms whether resistance is positive or negative. You know? So um, now um, I guess the, what question, the question I would like to ask you and by extension, uh, Noah, about that is this, how do you uh, sort of see your specific topics in your books as having a relationship to similar topics in not just in your field, but in the general field of what we call, I mean, I, I, I don't like to use the word African studies, but let's say that. So, which is, you know, a way of putting this in, a, in very concrete terms is to say, okay, queer studies is a question of identity. Uh, it used to be the question of, uh, in the way in which gender is a question of identity. And the idea is that does that, the, the question then is, how does that conception of identity in queer terms sort of articulate with other identities, right? I mean, in the sense that, okay, if folks are resistant positively or negatively to queer identity, what other forms of identity or kinds of identity can that, um, that resistance articulate with so that, so that whether it's right or wrong is no longer a question? I, I hope, does that sound like a question? Does, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, and for, for Noah, um, the way I'm trying to understand is this, is this. The, your book sort of bookends this relationship of Hollywood to Nigerian uh, cinematic or theatrical uh, tradition between the early periods at the beginning of Nigerian independence and the contemporary period where, you know, film going is, is part and parcel of, uh, of dissemination of cinema in Nigeria. But I guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand, is there a piece that's left out in this? Um, why is that piece left out? And why, how can really signaling it's include, the, the possibility of including it, uh, open your argument up in ways that might actually not sort of, that might get us beyond thinking in uh, only within these two bookends. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, I know that's a loaded question. I signal that, <laughs> that it's going to be a bit complicated, but I think that it gives me an opportunity to be able to, on the one hand, have a dialogue with you, but also to get our audience members to uh, get a sense of where your ideas are and how to actually think about them in very productive and because these are very serious issues you guys are broaching and I think that they need to be treated with that kind of seriousness. So um, I hope the questions are clear enough. I'm happy to repeat them if not, but in your answering, uh, maybe you actually help clarify what I'm saying to our audience. So who wants to go first? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, okay. So um, I, let me, let me uh, repeat the question back. Um, I, I, I think in, in some sense it's what you're asking um, amongst other things is, 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 um, is queerness uh, analogous to other forms of identity? Um, and are there ways of thinking about um, resistance, um, uh, sort of the, the, the multiple forms of resistance that can apply it to other categories. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, in that sense, I, I actually, that's a, um, you, you started off by saying you're going to ask us kind of common sense and easy questions and you, you, you did not. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I think that's really hard. I mean, there, to, to answer, um, because one of the things that I found, um, especially early on, I talked about the, the beginning of the, uh, of the project when I was researching um, uh, the, the Nollywood films is um, that there was something really specific going on 
with queerness in terms of um, both marking its existence and disallowing it at the same time. Um, and I, I'm, I don't think in terms of, um, I mean, I think in some ways we could think of, we can think of uh, a Nollywood film in particular of doing something um, similar in terms of, of, of gender. Um, I mean, Jonathan Haynes, um, which I address in the book, writes a really interesting response to my essay on, um, on beautiful faces um, and talks about how, um, how Nollywood, it's, you know, it's, it's been critiqued for, um, for its portrayal of women at the same time. Um, it, it's able to show, I'll use Noah's word independent um, and see what he does with that. Um, it's been able to showcase independent women. It's been able to um, create spaces for, again, to, to, uh, to, to, to mark Noah's work um, for Nollywood stars, Nollywood producers. Um, and so there is kind of this ambivalence as well. But I think there's actually something really specific happening with queerness and that nobody's denying the fact that women exist, <laughs> um, right? Um, and so I think that there is something really, really particular about what's happening. Um, to, to pivot to the, the South African films that I talk about, um, the ways in which some of these films um, um, kind of um, both succeed and fail at intersectionality, um, I think is something, oh, an in interesting way to think about it um, in terms of, of um, and in South Africa, of course, we have the question of, of race. Um, but I'm thinking of like the film, um, this film Canary, um, which is a really, really interesting film. It's a it's a coming of age and coming out um, musical um, uh, about um, a 18 year old who's a white gay 18 year old who's conscripted into the apartheid the defense force, the South African defense force. So, like on the one hand. Um, it, it just skewers Afrikaner masculinity. It completely, you know, um, calls out um, the the relationship between the apartheid government um, and the way in which they tried to hide behind, you know, religious rhetoric. Um, and on the other hand, and so it's it's a, I mean, it's it it just, you know, it, it it's a very obvious critique. On the other hand, um, you know, I found it kind of ambivalent in the sense of. Um, the fact that it really, it didn't really fully explore intersectionality. It doesn't have a, you know, a, a, any speaking roles by people of color. Um, it kind of, it kind of, um, one critic um, talks about how it kind of repeats the exclusion and the elision um, uh, of, of apartheid. Um, and, it, and so it's a film that I really like, I really just had a hard time putting my finger on. Um, so I think, I don't think that there's like an analogous form of identity. I think Krinis is 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 um, is specific in the way that it's being um, you know again denied and also like obsessed over at the same time. But I think that there's a lot of ways in which we can think about um, intersectionality and resistance more broadly um, and and com the com the complexity of resistance also when we think about um, the role of queer Af or the, sorry the role of, uh, of African cinema, just more broadly, um, uh, the way in which it can, and, and I think, you know, Noah, some, some of your um, material gets to this, the way in which it can kind of mark its, um, mark this, these um, like indigenous alternative ways of organizing life, and then also be complicit and participant in global capitalism at, at the same time. Um, so I think that, um, and I think that, no, you kind of addressed this a little bit about some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of resistance. And I was thinking that too, when I read your, what you were saying in terms of independence, um, that there is a, a lot of overlap. So I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, Nikine, but, um, I hopefully at least, um, said some interesting, yeah, <laughs> yeah, let, interesting let me, let me, before <laughs> Noah jumps in, let me quickly clarify this. Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, the basis for the question, especially with respect to, uh, other forms of identity. It was something that most people no longer remember, or maybe, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to uh, presume, but so in one of his early essays, Wally Shoyinka actually, uh, I've forgotten which now, uh, but I remember it because it's a very interesting moment. He was in a, um, in a rally in New York, uh, in, in London, and he observed gay people actually marching alongside African independent people and basically said, no, 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 this is not. <laughs> so, I mean, we cannot think that way anymore. You see what I'm saying? So, but I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that now that we're 
really talking about queer identity in this very inclusive, you know, uh, no longer neither nor we. Can we, in fact, imagine thinking about it as extending in other dimensions? So it's not necessarily analogous in that sense, but in terms of really being uh, sort of it, something that's taken for granted <laughs> as everything ought to be. Uh, without presuming that that's the end of it. I don't, I don't know that, that that makes sense, but that's actually what I was thinking mm -hmm. because it seems to me that, that that's what you were suggesting mm -hmm. towards the end of your introduction when you were talking about the way, ways of thinking beyond these binary ways of uh, imagining resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Noah, you want to jump in now, please? Oh, uh, sure. I, where should I begin? Uh, you mentioned uh, a major gap, uh, and you're right to draw attention to that gap. Um, I originally wanted to offer a 100-year history of these intersections between American capital and Nigerian aspirations for the big screen. Um, that ended up being unwieldy. Um, I produced a 600 page manuscript that everyone rejected. Um, and I sent it to Duke and, and Duke said, hell no, this is way too long. We can't even send this out to readers. This would be you know, a major burden for any peer reviewer, it's just too long. So I, I started cutting and I made the decision eventually in consultation with the editor at the University of California Press and in conversations with four peer reviewers over the years to just focus on two distinct historical moments. Uh, the excitement of independence, uh, the years around 1960, when Hollywood companies flocked to Nigeria, set up shop in Lagos, set up permanent offices in Lagos, and really tried to cash in on the excitement of independence. And the period after 2004. In 2004, the first multiplex opened in Nigeria. It was a Silverbird facility. And multiplexes have been constructed ever since. So it looks at those two moments, uh, 2004 coming five years after the return to ostensibly civilian rule, um, the fourth republic, the fourth attempt at democratic governance in Nigeria. And so what's really missing, uh, sadly, is the period between the second republic and the fourth republic. In 1981, the Motion Picture Association of America actually banned Hollywood exports to Nigeria in response to not just fears of piracy, but to the indigenization measures of the Shigari government, the Second Republic, and its efforts to achieve some sort of economic independence, um, some independence from Hollywood imperialism. And the response of the imperialists was to withhold their films. And many of us in Nollywood studies have written about that moment as generative, ultimately, of Nollywood, of the video revolution. Um, so yeah, there are definite gaps. And I think what is most, what I regret the most about leaving out the eighties and nineties is that I had to leave out, it meant having to leave out the role of Hollywood capital in Nigerian television. And the fact that while Hollywood companies stopped exporting films to Nigeria in 1981. They did not stop collaborating with Nigerian companies in the production of media. They continued to sponsor Nigerian television programs. Their, the, the products associated with them continued to be um, advertised on Nigerian television. So yeah, I had to delete all that, unfortunately. Um, so, so the book might seem limited as a result, but you know, the, the, the uninteresting answer is that space constraints led to that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it's uh, again, good to know that these are actually the, the nuts and bolts processes in writing a book, because once you have a final product, you begin to imagine things and make critiques, but then you do really, it's also interesting to know what practical decisions authors have to make 
in order to, uh, and how those decisions sort of uh, have an impact on how the, the product comes out. And uh, of course, you don't always have the opportunity to tell your reader that, no, I did that because my editor said this is, and because it was a long book. But again, uh, it's a, I mean, uh, this, this is interesting enough and generative enough that in fact, because, because it's there, it's then possible for other kinds of questions to be raised and in ways that actually would make sense for from the point of view of taking things forward. And since this is something you've written, there's also a possibility you write very fast anyway, you can maybe write another book very quickly. So that's a good thing. Our audience are already beginning to speak to us and I'll take the questions that have been posted on the, uh, on the chat. Uh, so there's a question for you, um, uh, Linty, you're asking whether you took, uh, in your research, whether you take the uh, countervailing influence of Bollywood and Chinese, that is Hong Kong cinemas on Nigerian film taste, you know, uh, whether that was something that was part of your, of your uh, uh, research. And also ask you to talk about another person, uh, Esther D, ask you if you could talk about one of the most tricky entanglements and resistance to subordination that you write about. Uh, that's for you, Lindsay. For Noah, maybe we'll take that and then also have Noah respond to his own question, which is uh, a very pragmatic one as related to uh, what we were saying earlier about your, uh, your the frame of your book. Uh, what sort of open source agreement did you make, manage to make to make your book available as a free download? And uh, again, thank you for a very fascinating talk, Noah. Thank you. So Lindsay, can we take start from you sure. and then have Lindsay uh, yeah, I, I, follow up? I wasn't totally able to hear the first question. I don't see it in the chat, but was it about- uh, oh, Okay, yeah. I, this is about uh, the, Hong whether you, yeah, Hong Kong and, and Bollywood. Uh, yeah, whatever. no, I'm, I was really focused on African cinema and the African continent. Um, okay. I, I talk about one film, um, uh, Indian film, Fire, um, because it was shown at the um, Nairobi Film Festival. Um, in the place of uh, of Rafiki, because Rafiki was uh, was censored, and so I talk about how it was um, a strategically put in there um, to um, talk about hope and possibility, because at that time India had just decriminalized um, homosexuality. Um, but I don't, I, I it was, it, but I don't talk about Bollywood or uh, other national cinemas. I'm really focused on. Um, on Africa, in, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I also don't talk very much about um, diasporic films. So I've left, I've left that for other scholars. Um, I wanted to really kind of focus on films that were being produced on the continent um, and think about um, the way that they circulated um, or didn't circulate on the continent. Um, and for uh, Esther's question, um, uh, I can answer, um, I, I think actually, and since I've already talked about, uh, I've already met, I'll, I'll, I'll mention two films that I've already started to talk about, but um, uh, so the question is the, one of the most tricky entanglements of resistance and subordination, which is a great question. Um, uh, I, think, I think the film Jezebel, um, the, the one that started it uh, really, really kind of um, uh, stuck. And in part because, um, you know, on the one hand, um, so, so Jezebel, the, the, the character Jezebel is also um, a, a Mamiwata figure. So Mamiwata is a um, mostly West African water spirit. Um, and and, and uh, she's said to take both um, male and female wives um, and or spouses. Um, and what's interesting is that this film kind of took rumors about um, uh, material gain, the, and and you and you also you gain wealth by being um, by by being married to to Mami Wata. Um, and so the film took these rumors uh, about Mami Wata um, and the, this idea that you would only like, basically the gay like the idea of gay for pay like that you would only you would only sleep with another woman in order to to gain material wealth. And actually, when I asked Sappho about you know, about this film, you know, if he, if this was, I don't know, I, my question was very basic at this point, but I was like, oh, like, does this like really, like, I was like, oh, is that a true story? You know? <laughs> um, and of course I was thinking, no, um, it's not, but he was like, well, yes, it is. Um, and he was like, do you see all these, like, you know, he's like, have you noticed all these women driving Mercedes and I'm like, 
sure, yes. Um, and he's like, well, they're lesbians. Um, and his his idea was that that you that that being that being gay, especially for women, somehow like led you to mysterious forms of wealth, and that he was kind of helping to explain this. Um, so as I said, you know, for the most part, you know, the, the um, queer women and, or, or women who simply women, um, uh, Serena Danko uh, in particular avoids these of the term queer because these aren't always necessarily women who identify as queer. You know, we're saying like this film is really like really damaging and really stereotypical um, and really puts us in a bad light. Uh, uh, so, and, and that's, that's absolutely true. Um, but what was interesting is as I was reading this, as I was, you know, analyzing this film, um, I started to think how radical it was to be marking an, an indigenous form of African queerness. And, um, and Carmen Gay, the film Carmen Gay, Carmen Gay is also linked to a water spirit as well, um, a West African water spirit as well. And in that film, um, it's not, it's not a, um, she's not being punished for it. Um, it's part of her, you know, her eccentricity um, and, and who she is as this kind of rebellious, um, rebellious figure. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's one moment where I think, you know, like, wow, there's something really fascinating that's happening. It's not just marking the existence of it, but it's like tying it into, you know, tie it. To, I mean, on the one hand, it's like, okay, this needs to be, you know, the film is basically saying like, this is dangerous and it needs to be uh, eliminating. On the other hand, it's saying, you know, queerness actually has some tie. And I, I tried so hard to find things that were written about Mami Wata and queerness. And I, and I really couldn't, um, uh, find a whole lot. I found a couple of things that I, that I put in there, but, um, but that was articulating, um, a, an in, like, as, as I said, like an indigenous form of pre-colonial, um, uh, articulation or of, of, of queerness. Um, and so that was, that's one, I've got another film, but I, um, uh, I'll, if we have time, I can come back to it uh, as my my second my second most tricky. But I think that was you know I think that that was one of, a, a moment too that I was like I can't quite you know from the very beginning I can't quite wrap my head around this. Thank you, uh, Noah. Do you want to take your question? And then sure, yeah, there, there's yeah. another one for you, but yep. you want to take yep, that. So, uh, yep. I'll begin with the question about open access. Um, the University of California Press has an amazing open access initiative known as Luminos, and it provides participating uh, publications with um, free PDFs. Uh, there's a, a free to download PDF version of my book, and uh, it costs uh, at least $8,000, so you have to get a subvention. Um, you have to find some way to cobble that money together, and I was able to put that money together from various grants. You know, I spent years applying for grants for this. My goal was to just make the book more accessible to readers on the African continent because when I wrote my book, Nollywood Stars, seven or eight years ago, uh, when I published that, which is a study of Nollywood Star System, uh, so many of the people I interviewed on the African continent were asking me where they could get it and were complaining about the fact that it wasn't in bookstores and they couldn't easily buy it. And so I was just sending copies to them uh, in the mail. And I said to myself, if I ever write another book on African cinema, I want it to be more available to readers on the African continent. And so uh, that's why I went with Luminos ultimately. Um, the uh, the charge of ethnocentrism is certainly provocative. I will say that this book is primarily a study of big screen exhibition. And so it is a history of Hollywood imperialism. So it looks at the persistent efforts of Hollywood companies to dominate the Nigerian theatrical marketplace, as those Hollywood companies have dominated theatrical marketplaces all around the world since 1916. Beginning in 1916, Hollywood became the most powerful force and dominant exhibition. That's just a fact. And there's no way to romanticize Hollywood out of the equation when you're looking at the formal economy of big screen cinema, which is another reason I don't 
rely on Ramon Lobato's work. I appreciate Ramon Lobato's work, uh, but I do think that scholars of Nollywood over rely on it and uh, over invest in the sort of romanticization of informality that persists. Um, you know, Ramon Lobato is writing about shadow economies of cinema and the big screen is not a shadow economy. This is a formal enterprise. This is a highly regulated, highly formalized uh, set of business practices. And you can praise its inclusion of Nollywood. You can see that as heroically independent. You can celebrate it as wonderfully indigenous, some do. Or you can see that as uh, a compromised entanglement with Hollywood capital. I mean, there's no one right way to read this, which is why I think Lindsay's concept of resistance is so productive. And I was so thrilled to read her brilliant engagement with the nuances of resistance and how it's not reducible to our received notions of it, our, our received romanticization of it. So, um, you know, I use the, the, term independence loosely. I use it broadly. I use it to signal not just literal political independence achieved in 1960, uh, and some would say renewed in 1999, but also to consider what is truly Nigerian, what is a specifically indigenous victory, uh, you know, what, what is a Nigerian achievement, if it is conditioned by Hollywood capital, because it has to be conditioned by Hollywood capital. There's no way, unfortunately, and so the book includes a certain critique of the Nigerian federal, federal government's resistance to protectionism. Um, so, you know, if you own a, a chicken farm um, like Obasanjo, then you can get the federal government to uh, freeze frozen chicken exports to Nigeria, right? But there is no equivalent uh, policy in Nigeria that would limit Hollywood's hegemony. There just isn't. Um, you know, there's no protectionist policy pertaining to theatrical exhibition. So that's a state failure. That's a governmental failure that we can and should talk about and that I address in the book. I take issue with that uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and, you know, there are just, there are infrastructural requirements that prevent, you know, a kind of pure independence. Um, multiplexes in Nigeria have to be DCI compliant. DCI stands for Digital Cinema Initiatives. And that is a, a format, a theatrical, technological playback format, a presentation format that is proprietary. It was developed by Disney and Paramount and Fox and a number of other major companies, Hollywood companies, American companies that require compliance with it. So there's really, there's no way to get around that. There's no way, you can call it ethnocentric, but there's, there's just no way to sidestep the reality of Hollywood domination. Um, informal, yeah, yeah, informality is certainly important in thinking about the resistance of Nollywood to imperialism, but my book is not primarily about Nollywood, it's about big screen exhibition. You, you know, we can debate whether a new Nollywood film exhibited on the big screen uh, is a Nollywood film or not. Um, you know, I think it is. But, uh, you know, my book is not about straight to video films. It's not about, you know, people watching movies in video parlors or at home. It's not about VHS. It's not about VCD. It's not about DVD. All right. Well, thank you. Um, well, thank, thanks for taking the question by Rejoice Abutsa. Uh, I, I, I think you did that, Anwar, because uh, uh, in the uh, the question was asked in the process of the first question being answered, so we don't have to go to that. Um, let me just ask this question, which is kind of related to, uh, to the question about how to make your book accessible, Noah, and this is a question for both of you. One thing I noticed about your books is the fact that you use a lot of images and figures that actually require permission. Okay, and 
uh, because of the nature of digital technology these days, things are freely available, but then copyright restrictions are getting increasingly tight. And so I just wanted to, you to share with our audience what processes you've gone to, to be able to, because stills are different from screen grabs, right? And in Lindsay's book, most of the images there are actually stills, if not all, as far as I can tell. And so I, I just want to know, uh, uh, want you to talk to us about this uh, other end of producing a scholarly book where you actually need to be able to secure, right? And how easy that was or difficult that was and what kind of uh, constraints or ease you experience in doing that. And then we have two new questions coming in, but uh, if you can just quickly take that. Yeah, there are some, some very interesting questions coming in. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I can I can answer the question really quickly. Actually, all of my images were screen grabs, um, so those were all fair fair use. Um, okay. Yeah, so I I lucked out there. Um, with the, okay. there there are a few there were a few exceptions, um, but um, but yeah, for the most part, they were all screen grabs, um, okay. and so th those are fair use. Yeah, same, same here. I, I use primarily screen grabs uh, with the exception of the cover image, which is an, an image of Sidney Poitier and Eartha Kitt on location in Inugu in the Eastern region in 1956. They arrived in late 1956 to film an American movie, The Mark of the Hawk, a movie that was made with the financial participation of the Eastern Region government. Basically, the Eastern Region government was trying to trumpet its autonomy. Um, and so it's a, a really interesting ex example of the regionalization of the decolonization process. So in late colonial Nigeria, this uh, intersection between Hollywood capital and Nigerian capital. Um, that is an image that happens to be in my personal collection. It's one of my favorite images of all time. Um, I haven't been able to identify the photographer. I don't know who took this picture. Um, it's, uh, you know, the archival provenance of, of the picture is cited in the book. Um, so, you know, the, the, the book is, is used with, the, the image rather, uh, like some of the others in the book, um, is used with the uh, kind permission of, of an archive. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, questions online. Uh, Lindsay, there's a question from Tunde Onikoyi asking you to give your impression about coroners in Nigeria and Kenya. Mentioning Kenya because I understand that there exist agencies that back the rights for queer epitome. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then a question for Noah from Ken Harrow uh, is uh, how large is screen audience compared with those of platforms like Amazon? Is there uh, a viable screen audience elsewhere on the continent that competes with digital network audiences? So. Sure, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm totally understanding the question. And I think it's also, I, I'm not, I don't know if I can talk about queerness in, in general, but I, uh, in, in Nigeria and Kenya, but, but what I can say is this, um, uh, th those are really two very, very interesting countries to think about together in terms of, of queer African cinema. Um, so on the one hand, you've got Nigeria um, producing, you know, dozens and dozens of, of these films um, that um, for, for the most part are, you know, I mean, be, they do, they, in order to pass the, the, uh, the muster of the censors board, um, they do, there has to be some condemnation of, of, of queerness. Um, but there are a lot of queer films that are, that exist. Um, the um, the I mentioned the Initiative for Equal Rights um, uh, is making much more sympathetic films um, that are not getting censored, that are going through the censors board um, and and not um, one film um, uh, we don't live here anymore um, actually got cleared to show in theaters. Um, that then there was questions about you know as Noah mentioned whether the theater would show it, but it it got a um, they were expecting to get an 18 and over rating and it got a 15 and over rating. Um, so they were even surprised that it got, you know, um, that, it, that it, and it's not, it's not an explicit film. Um, and there are, you know, um, there are, uh, the, the life doesn't turn out great for the queer characters in that film. Um, but it's one that is made with the explicit intention 
um, uh, of making you challenge your homophobia. Um, and they don't, they don't hide that. Um, so that film was not censored, it was shown. Um, and, um, and so, but, but Nigeria, you have the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, right? So you have some of the most draconian laws on the continent um, uh, and in, in, in which, you know, um, and people are very scared of those laws. So they're very scared about um, getting called out for, for promotion um, even though that's not actually really part of it, but, but there's a lot of fear, um, a lot of self-censorship. On the other hand, you have Kenya, um, which, you know, as I was writing this, as I was going to the Out Nairobi Film Festival was uh, like, they thought on the verge of decriminalization, um, there's, um, you know, Kenya is kind of known for teeing in, um, I mean, it's complicated, but queer refugees from neighboring Uganda. Um, and so in, in some sense, you've got a much, much more progressive um, and permissive atmosphere, but you have the Kenyan Film Classification Board that has censored films like Stories of Our Lives, um, Rafiki, another documentary, another film, I Am Samuel, it's a documentary. And so these Kenyan, queer Kenyan films aren't actually being shown in Kenya. Um, and so there's this kind of like, that's why I said thinking about Nigeria and Kenya together is actually really interesting in, in part because it's a little bit counterintuitive um, that the censorship in Kenya um, is is actually much more um, intense than the censorship in Nigeria. And Nigerians screened Rafiki. Um, and you don't need, in, in Nigeria, you don't need, um, you, it doesn't, a film that like shows at a film festival, it's, it's considered a private event. So Rafiki's screened um, in Lagos. Um, and um, and so it's um, it's it's a bit counterintuitive. And, and it, it, it took me a while to kind of like, you know, un understand that each of these countries, like that's why I broke my um, my book down by um, by either region or country to kind of think about the specificities um, uh, in each country um, to yeah to kind of like hammer out those details. So that's that's what I can say to, to that. And I was actually just yeah in the chat responding to to what Lindsay just said because uh, you know she brings up a really important point which is that there are theatrical or quasi theatrical or non theatrical alternatives to Film House and Silverbird um, and so maybe I I was yeah. No. <laughs> I'm thinking back to Rejoice's comment about informality and, and realizing that I didn't answer it adequately because, uh, as I point out in my book, there are, it's, it's hard to get, and this is a, another way of answering Ken's question, it's, it's hard to get exact numbers because there are so many pop-up facilities, there are so many provisional temporary uh, screening rooms in Nigeria, right? There are um, makeshift um, festival spaces. Um, in the conclusion of my book, I write about a, an amusement center uh, in Lagos known as Happy Land, Happy World, which has a 73, 70 seat theater and actually uh, serves as a subsequent run movie theater. So it's not first run. It's not the first place in Lagos where you can see Black Panther, but it is uh, a place where you can, you know, see John Wick a year or two after its premiere, right? Um, and there are other spaces like that. There, There is uh, a four screen cinema in Delta State known as Lighthouse. Um, so there are, there are some, you know, less formal, less capitalized movie theaters in Nigeria. Um, but I will say in response to Ken's question that to qualify as a theatrical hit in Nigeria today, a movie has to make just $250,000, um, which is uh, interesting for a number of reasons. Omogedo the Saga, which was released in December of 2020, made over a million dollars at Filmhouse. And to this day, it is the highest grossing Nigerian produced theatrical release. Um, but the highest grossing release period is still to this day, Black Panther. Black Panther sold 600,000 tickets in Filmhouse locations. 
And there are 60, there are currently 60 DCI compliant multiplexes in Nigeria, which uh, translates to roughly 700 screens. Uh, actually, well, 700 to 800 screens uh, that are just DCI compliant. So uh, that's probably, I would say, about half uh, to one third of the total theatrical screens in Nigeria, if you factor in places like Happy Land, Happy World, and Lighthouse Cinemas. So, uh, so it's hard to say. And, and certainly when it comes to uh, Amazon and Netflix, it's, it's just impossible to get numbers. Everything is black boxed. You know, Netflix doesn't share uh, that information and neither does Amazon. So there, there's no way to really know how many people are watching Nollywood movies on Amazon or Netflix. I, I want to jump in and add to that. There's also um, uh, really quickly, um, the Equality Hub and Pamela Ad Adie uh, produced a film called uh, Ife, which is a beautiful short film. Um, and she, you know, their strategy was you know, not to, not even Amazon or, um, or Netflix or theatrical release. I mean, they had a, they had a, um, uh, a, a premiere, but she, she was just like, I'm creating my own streaming network. Um, and it's called the Quality Hub TV. And you, you know, you can pay to stream um, like queer African media content. And so that, that like, there's other models too that are being um, put into place. And I'm really, you know, I'm really excited and hopeful about that. It was a really interesting way. And, you know, CNN kept writing, oh, this is the film that the Nigerian censors board banned. And like, that actually never happened. Like, she was just like, I'm not submitting this to the censors board. Like, I don't need them. I don't need to show it in movie theaters anyway. Um, that, you know, so it was like completely like the, the international news, like media just completely bungled that whole story. And she's like, no, I'm not submitting it. I don't have to submit it. I'm allowed to make it. In Kenya, that wouldn't be the case. In Kenya, like stories of our lives, like they got, um, they got fined for failing to, because they didn't submit their script and get it approved beforehand. So there's just, there's a whole set of regulations in Kenya that exist that don't exist in, in, in Nigeria, actually. And so you know, if it was just made and then they made their own streaming network. Um, and, um, and so there's also these, you know, um, thinking, thinking about questions of big screens and formality and informality um, in both our projects. I think that that's an interesting example. Yeah, that's such a great point, you know, and, and anyone who writes about Nigeria knows that you have to leave out so much simply because of the sheer diversity, the sheer size of the country. Um, you know, those of us who work on Nollywood, work on entertainment films produced in southern Nigeria, usually start by saying that we're excluding the north. We're not, you know, going to tell you anything about anything that's happening north of Abuja because, you know, we just have to uh, focus. We have to provide a certain uh, frame. And so while my book is about the big screen and these formalized processes of exhibition, um, that's not to suggest, and I even point out in the book, that uh, there aren't alternatives. You know, Asaba films, which I've written about before, are still in the majority. You know, they're still thriving. You know, Inugu is producing, you know, hundreds of movies a month, uh, according to the old model of Nollywood, the model that we associate with old Nollywood from the early 1990s. So that hasn't gone away. It's still flourishing, you know. Uh, there is still resistance, right? There's still independence. There's still um, idiosyncratic methods of distribution and exhibition in Nigeria. So I'm glad Lindsay brought that up, definitely. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks to both of you. Uh, we seem to have uh, no questions coming in and we're actually right getting to the end of our time allotted. And so I don't know whether you guys have very, uh, some kind of summary or parting comments that you want to make uh, about this. I do not have any questions that will be easily answered. <laughs> so I don't want to waste your time, but uh, if you do have some general comments to make about this, we're, we can take another minute or two and then we'll bring these to a close. Um, yeah, I just, I want to echo this point that there's like so much that we have to leave out. Uh, but one of the things mm -hmm. that I leave out is um, North African cinema, but um, there's a fabulous scholar um, uh, based in South Africa right now, Gibson and um, uh, who's who's written and write, continuing to write on queer North African films. Um, and, and I think it's kind of like, um, it's also in some ways exciting to leave stuff out um, because it's, um, I'm, I'm excited to hear 
what other scholars have to say. I, I don't I don't deal with documentary films and that's a whole, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about documentary films. Um, Kwame Utu has written about them, Uno Mazua, there's, there's, you know, people that are, are writing about them and that will continue um, to write about documentary films. Like to me, that was just like a different um, set of questions. Um, and then, as I said, I, I don't write about diaspora films. And I think that's another um, area that is right for, for exploration. So um, yeah, it is important to think, you know, to think about the fact that you know, we're limited in terms of time and space and like we're already spending years and years researching this. So, um, you know, I, I look at that as, uh, I look at these exclusions in, in some ways as productive um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing. Um, there's a whole generation of queer African studies is just this kind of um, burgeoning emerging field right now. And there's so many, um, there's so many young scholars and many of them based on the continent that are doing this work. Um, and so it's, to me, it's, it's really actually exciting time. So. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, when I started working on this book, I asked myself if I wanted to try to push myself to consider the North. And I gave up immediately because I just don't work on the North. Uh, I don't have any experience in the North. And, you know, Brian Larkin has already done that work, it, it, to my mind. Um, so, you know, I wanted to begin by saying, you know, if, if you're interested in open air cinemas in the North, just read Signal and Noise, just just read Brian Larkin. Uh, and you know, when I was researching this book, it was really interesting to look at how um, climate specific variations motivated particular experiments with the big screen. You know, the, the rainy season in particular motivated attempts to introduce roofed cinemas or four walled cinemas in the South. And also, you know, air conditioner companies in uh, air conditioning companies in southern Nigeria, like Nigerian Electrical Works and Aluchi Electrical Works based out of Lagos, were partnering with American exhibition companies to provide air conditioning in cinemas like the Roxy and the Rex in Lagos and Inugu and Ibadan. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to, to consider and so much that you have to leave out. And I, I like that Lindsay suggests that that's productive. There's a certain, um, yeah, I mean, you know, in some ways we're inviting other people to fill those gaps. Okay, that's good. Well, thank you. Um, thanks to both of you. This is very, uh, very stimulating, very interesting books. And I'll ask our audience to actually take these books um, because uh, I have a core African cinemas with me as a book. <laughs> I have, I mean, I can share my screen because being able to download Cinematic Independence gave me an opportunity to get the free download. I'll buy the free print as well. I haven't. Uh, it's a new book. Actually, we were trying to get it on a bill back in February, in January, but it came out in February. So we missed it, but we are able to, we're happy to bring it back. So I uh, know I'm showing it to you in book, I will have it as well. So thanks to both of you. And thanks as always to our audience for this very stimulating, uh, uh, supportive uh, attendance. We thank you. Uh, this actually is our last event for the academic year because uh, May is the uh, month of the African Literature Sessions Conference. I will try to uh, sort of channel our energies for that month there and then the summer months come. But uh, hopefully in September, uh, the beginning of another academic year, we'll bring this event back. And uh, we thank you for being with, uh, staying with us for the past uh, several months uh, since uh, September last year when we began the second and the series. And so thank you. And thank you to Lindsay and, and Noah for your attention and your attendance. Thank you. I'll be, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Uh, Thanks so thank much. You, everyone. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Thanks everyone who came. Take care. Mm -hmm. Thank you.